Next, we are going to hear from Elizabeth Harrington and all things around genetics. So I want to introduce to you Ellie Harrington. She is an ABGC board certified genetic counselor and lecturer in the Department of Neurology at Columbia University. Ms. Harrington received her graduate degree in human genetics and genetic counseling from the Stanford University School of Medicine. She provides genetic counseling expertise in neuromuscular, neurodegenerative, and motor neuron diseases, and specifically provides clinical genetic counseling to patients and families with ALS. In addition to her clinical and academic responsibilities, she directs the ALS Families Project Research Study, a pre-symptomatic natural history study designed to understand the genetic un underpinnings of genetic forms of ALS and the impact on affected families. So, Ellie, you're a very busy woman. Thank you for being with us today. I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much. Let me just share my screen here. Okay, great. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone today. And um, as Nicole mentioned, I'll be speaking a bit about genetics and ALS. So probably uh, for many of you, the last time uh, we've thought about gene genetics was back in high school. So I'll very briefly begin with a big picture brief overview of basic genetics before diving into how it's related to ALS. So obviously humans are complex beings. We're made of trillions of cells. And in the center of our cells contains our complete genetic code, our genome, which is packaged onto what we call chromosomes. And when we unwind our chromosomes, we can see the specific spelling of our DNA, which in chunks make up our genes. So we have over 20,000 genes in all of our cells that make us who we are. These genes provide really specific uh, instructions to produce proteins that then have very specific functions in the cell. So when we're talking about genetic testing, genetic testing in ALS, we're talking about testing specific genes. And you can think about genetic testing like reading through one of these genes with a spell checker, looking for a spelling mistake or what we call a mutation. So a mutation in a gene can lead to the function of the protein and thus the function in the cell to be disturbed and not uh, work properly. So continuing with our basic genetics, let's talk about how we share our genes within our families. I promise I won't show you a Punnett square here, but we all have two copies of all of our genes held on our chromosomes. And when we have children of our own, we pass down either one copy or the other, and our partner does the same. So our children are an equal combination of both ourselves and our partner. What's true of most of the genes that are associated with ALS is that they have what we call autosomal dominant inheritance. So in this figure here, I've put a little mutation on one of our genes. And um, it, when we pass our genetic information down to our children, if there's a mutation present, then there's a 50% chance that that mutation was passed down and also an equal 50% chance that the normal working copy was passed down. So this is really touching on um, if one is, is, has genetic testing, if a mutation is found, what's the chance that a family member also has that same gene mutation? For most of these genes that we know cause disease, there's likely a 50% chance that uh, that first degree relatives also carry an associated gene mutation. The next question we think about though is, if someone does have a gene mutation, what's the risk for them actually developing disease symptoms? That's really quite variable. It depends on the gene that we're talking about, and it depends on the variant or the mutation within the gene. So really not all risk is equal. And I'll kind of provide an example in the next couple of slides to demonstrate this. 
So this figure here um, in this jar at the bottom, we all have a baseline risk for developing disease. And there's a threshold in which over time someone might develop disease symptoms. So what's involved in, in reaching that threshold? Well, we know there's some environmental factors that can play a role and also genetic factors. So over one's life, individuals might be exposed to certain environmental factors or be born with certain small genetic factors, but not enough to reach that threshold and actually develop disease symptoms. Here we can first demonstrate uh, what we call sporadic ALS or singleton ALS, which makes up the majority of people who have ALS, 90% of the population. And for them, it's caused by, as I mentioned, a combination of both environmental factors and smaller genetic factors. So this is an example of an individual uh, where they typically don't have a family history of disease. Um, it's occurring in them for the first time in their family. This is different from genetic ALS, which is often termed familial ALS. So an individual here might start with a big genetic risk factor. So a single gene mutation that increases their risk for disease and over their lifetime also have exposure to certain environmental factors or other small genetic factors that have them reach the threshold and thus develop symptoms of disease. So this is an example of what we call a reduced penetrance variant, where that big initial genetic cause isn't uh, automatically giving them 100% chance of developing disease, but certainly starts them off at a higher thresh or a higher baseline risk than the general population. Another type of genetic risk is a more highly penetrant variant. So this is a, a larger genetic risk factor that puts someone at, at an almost 100% risk for developing disease in their lifetime. So these are examples of different variants within genes that are known to cause disease. So again, not all risk is equal. One of the, the reasons why is it's due to this variable penetrance. So penetrance is really, if someone has a mutation, what's the likelihood of them going on to develop disease symptoms themselves? So depending on the variant we're talking about, that might not be 100%. Not all individuals who have a certain gene mutation may go on to develop disease symptoms. So moving on from kind of our basic genetics and terminology I'm gonna be using in this is how does this all play a role in ALS? So we can kind of work backwards here. Uh, there's a lot of different pathways, proteins, cellular functions that keep our motor neurons healthy and functioning properly. And it's specific genes that code for those cellular roles and functions. So I've listed here on the left a number of different genes that uh, play a role in uh, healthy motor neuron functioning. So if there's a mutation in a gene that typically plays a role in that normal motor neuron health, the mutation can result in abnormal proteins, so those clumpy aggregates, proteins, and function, and thus lead to motor neuron degeneration and death. So one of the most common questions I hear is, is ALS genetic? Is it hereditary? What's my genetic risk? So let's talk about some of those risks. So I mentioned the term sporadic. You'll see this, you know, perhaps in some literature and posted online. This is um, the most common type of ALS where an individual is the first in their family to have disease and there's no family history, like 90% of individuals. And as we've talked about, it's likely caused by a combination of different environmental and small genetic factors. There are 
some groups of individuals at a slightly increased risk for developing disease. So ALS is an adult onset disease, typically occurring between 55 and 75, so age is a risk factor. We also know that men are slightly more likely than women to develop ALS, though uh, as we age, that difference between men and women somewhat dis disappears. And also those in the military and uh, uh, those who are of European ancestry are at a slightly increased risk. One of the largest or strongest risk factors though for developing ALS is having a family history of disease. So we know that if someone has a strong family history, meaning two or more affected family members, the chance of another person in the family developing ALS is about one in three. So this is often termed that familial or genetic ALS, which makes up about 10% of people who have ALS. So again, most people do not have a family history of disease, and that can kind of help us predict the likelihood of you or them having an underlying gene mutation that's causing disease. As you can see on the left in grit, in gray, the majority um, of these individuals, we do not uh, identify an underlying gene mutation. There's a small percentage of people where we still might find a gene mutation upon testing, and that might be due to a few different things. They may have a really small family where disease wasn't uh, detected in anyone else. They could have been adopted or not know their family history well, which is common. There may have been uh, early deaths in the family, so someone might not have lived long enough for them to develop disease symptoms in their lifetime. And lastly, um, penetrance, as we talked about, has a good amount to do with it. So not everyone um, who has a mutation might develop disease symptoms. So some of these genetic forms can kind of hide in families. Separately, for those who do have a family history of disease, so that 10% of people, we do typically find a single underlying gene mutation, which we believe is the cause of their disease and likely their family member's disease. So what are those specific genes or genetic causes? I listed a few earlier, but there's the multitude of different genes that when mutated can cause disease. So the figure here is showing a proportion of gene mutations that cause disease in individuals with familial disease. And you can see that the C9ORF72 gene and the SOD1 gene are the two most common genetic causes of disease. Here's a figure of those with sporadic disease, the only ones in their family with disease. Again, you can see in gray, we have good reason to say there's usually not an underlying genetic uh, or gene mutation that's causing their disease. But for those who do have one, those uh, the mutations we find in these individuals are the same that we find in those with familial disease. So this is just a, a graph showing uh, the genes discovered over time. So SOD1 was the first gene discovered in the 1990s, and the size of the circle tells us the proportion of uh, the contribution uh, that gene mutation has to disease. So the bigger the circle, uh, the biggest, the bigger the contribution to disease. So we can see again here that C9 and SOD1 are the most common genetic causes. These are also two of the genes that have um, related clinical drug trials um, that are actively in clinical trial, which I'll mention briefly later on in. Um, in the presentation. So first let's talk about SOD1. Um, here is a figure of the SOD1 gene. 
Again, you can think about genetic testing like reading through the gene with a spell checker, looking for a spelling mistake or mutation. So the small black text ab above kind of the blue line represents the many different disease-associated variants or mutations that there are within SOD1. So there's actually over 180 disease-causing variants. So you can have a mutation at any one of these locations within the gene that may increase one's risk for developing disease. It's important to know this because not all mutations are the same. So for example, as, as I mentioned in those previous slides with the jars, uh, we'll talk about those variants again. So SOD1A5V, so five just um, showing us the location of this variant, um, is at the beginning of the gene as shown in the red box. And this is a much more rapidly progressive and aggressive form of ALS. So it has a little bit of an earlier age of onset. It's a more quickly progressive disease. And it's uh, responsible for, the, uh, for about 50% of SOD1 mutations in North America. On um, the contrary, we can look at a different mutation, SOD1 I114T, so further down in the gene at location 114. This is a more slowly progressive disease and has a later onset. So about 50% of people who have this mutation typically develop disease at the age of 60 and closer to 80%, 88% of people have disease by the age of 80. So we're talking about the same gene, but different variants and different disease risks. So kind of the importance of the distinqui uh, distinguishing different variants within a, a gene. So let's talk about C9 now quickly. The mutation that causes C9 or F72 related ALS is a little bit different than most gene mutations where we think about looking at them through that spell checker. So the specific mutation that causes disease here is what we call a repeat expansion. And that just means that at the beginning of this gene, there's a sequence that's spelled GGGGCC, six letter sequence, and it typically just repeats itself a few times. The mutation is when that has abnormally expanded to hundreds or thousands of repeats, and that uh, causes the gene not to function properly. So this, we can actually date this mutation. We believe it occurred in Scandinavia about uh, 1500 years ago, and we can trace the mutation back to the Vikings and actually map the spread of this mutation across their coastline conquers, as shown in the figure on the bottom right. So this kind of relates back to knowing one's ancestry, knowing one's family history, is um, the majority of people who we find have mutations in this C9ORF72 gene come from Scandinavian uh, descent. This also has variable penetrance. So um, we believe that about 50% of individuals typically develop disease symptoms by the age of 58, and the risk of developing disease increases even more as one um, ages. This is really the most common genetic cause of ALS. It's also the most common genetic cause of a certain form of dementia called frontotemporal dementia, FTD. This is different from uh, the most common form of dementia, Alzheimer's disease, where we typically think of memory loss as the main symptom. FTD symptoms um, are a bit more behavioral in nature. So individuals may develop really poor judgment, a loss of empathy, socially inappropriate behavior, lack of inhibition. So in a genetic counseling session, 
uh, genetic counselor might ask you about your family history, if anyone has a history of ALS or related diseases like FTD. I also wanted to quickly mention some of these related clinical trials, which may have been mentioned in a previous talk today, and I apologize, I wasn't able to uh, get out of uh, my clinical responsibilities to observe those talks. So I apologize if this is repetitive information. Um, but the main ones that we think about uh, related to these genes that I've mentioned are what we call antisense oligonucleotide therapies, ASO therapies. So here we have the central dogma again, how um, the importance of our human genome in, pro in proper protein functioning and how proteins are built from DNA. So again, we begin with DNA, it's transcribed into what we call messenger RNA or mRNA. You can think of this like an instruction file that carries information and that helps us build proteins. When we have a mutated, mutated DNA, we have mutated RNA and that mRNA and that leads to destabilization, damage, and contributes to the misfolding and aggregation of these toxic proteins that can aggregate in motor neurons and cause disease. So these antisense therapies really change the process of producing a protein before it even begins. So these are short single-stranded pieces of DNA that match the complementary sequence of the mRNA. They're really designed to specifically seek out and bind to that mRNA in a specific manner so that the amount of disease-causing protein is dramatically reduced. So we're no longer producing that abnormal toxic protein and thus hopefully preventing further disease progression. So there, there have been um, much development in these types of um, ASO therapies in the field of ALS, but also other neurodegenerative conditions. Specific to ALS, um, the SOD1 ASO uh, is in phase three of clinical trial. The C9ORF72 related ASO is in phase one of clinical trial. We're in startup phase three for a new bus, um, which is another uh, earlier onset uh, ALS related gene. And there's been much success in that SOD1 uh, uh, clinical trial that uh, there's been, that been the announcement for startup for a pre-symptomatic SOD1 ASO trial. So giving people this drug before the onset of symptoms. So for people who carry an SOD1 gene mutation, they're at risk for developing disease symptoms and they're given this drug in advance to that. So going back to how this really might be relevant to you specifically and the first step in all of this and thinking about genetic testing, many of you might be asking, should I get tested or how could I get tested? And there's many different things to consider with genetic testing. So I'll list some reasons why some individuals may decide to get tested or may decide not to. So some um, uh, you know, are interested in learning if there is an underlying cause for their disease and want to get testing out of, out of pure interest. It may help us inform you about potential clinical trial opportunities. So if you were interested in one of those uh, genetically targeted clinical drug trials, first step is really getting tested to learn um, if you have an underlying gene mutation. Some individuals are interested uh, to see if their family members are at risk to provide their family members with that information so that they can make informed decisions for themselves. And some uh, are interested for themselves or for their family members for their future, fam future planning or family planning. So there are many family planning options that are now available that can take into account 
um, uh, genetic mutations within a family. On the other side of things, you know, many at this point, these uh, uh, drugs that are in clinical trial are not FDA approved. So we can't say it's for certain going to change someone's care plan, and thus some people aren't that interested in getting tested. There are also, also risks involved in these clinical trials, and for some that might outweigh the potential benefit. There's obviously some anxiety that can surround a genetic diagnosis and the thought of um, providing that risk information to family members. Having this diagnosis, learning your own diagnosis is plenty enough to worry about and some decide not to get testing because it's too much to think about at this time. Uh, there can be a potential cost of testing. This used to be a bigger factor, but there's many different um, options now. And as genetic uh, technology has increased over time, the cost of testing has gone down a lot. There's also some potential insurability discrimination risks that we talk about. Um, this is typically not so much for an individual who has disease symptoms and that's documented in their medical record, but may be something for family members to take into account if they ever want to get tested um, after a person in their family with ALS has been found to have a gene mutation. So that's something to certainly talk in more detail about with a genetic counselor, again, mostly for unaffected family members rather than an individual with disease symptoms themselves. So what's involved with testing? How to go about getting testing? So the person to speak to is your uh, neurologist, their ALS specialist, a genetic counselor. They'll walk you through the different testing options. Typically that's at least for that C9 gene, but can be comprehensive to the many other genes that we know are associated with disease and have you sign an informed consent. Um, this can be done by a blood draw or a saliva collection or cheek swab kit. From that, we're just isolating your DNA and again, looking at these specific genes. That is sent to a commercial genetic testing laboratory, a CLIA approved laboratory, and it typically takes about four to six weeks to get results back. What can you expect from these results? So a negative result or a normal result means that no abnormalities were found on testing in any of the genes that were looked at. A positive result means that, um, or an abnormal result means that a, a disease causing variant was identified in one of these ALS associated genes. This can confirm one's diagnosis and one can provide more information about the specific additional risks for family members. There's a third type of result called a variant of uncertain significance, just to complicate things further. So this just means that a uh, variant or change in the DNA code of one of these genes was identified on testing, but we don't have enough scientific evidence to say if that variant is actually altering the function of that protein or, or gene, or if it's just normal variation in the genetic code that makes one person different from another. So these are, are fairly common. Typically they're, they're benign in nature and not disease causing, but always important to mention in advance to getting results back um, as it is at, an option um, uh, on the genetic report. So some general takeaways. Um, we've talked a lot about the specifics of genetics and genetic risk, but I'll have you remember that single genetic causes are most commonly in, in identified in those individuals who have a family history of disease. So most people, again, don't have a family history of disease and thus, uh, their risk for having an underlying gene mutation is much lower. 
Um, the actual risk for families with a known gene mutation depends on that specific gene and specific variants. That goes back to the penetrance we were talking about. Um, we're talking about genetics a lot more. People are doing a lot more genetic testing because there's emerging clinical trials. So that's one of the main reasons why this is becoming a bigger part of the conversation. Remember that genetic testing is optional. There's many benefits, risks, and limitations of testing. So all of these should be considered prior to pursuing testing and learning one's results. And that really concludes um, my part of this uh, symposium today. And I'm happy to stop here and take any questions if we have time. We do, thank you, Ellie. All right. Um, so Kimberly sent in a question. My husband had FALS with C9ORF72 gene and passed last June of 2020. Her daughter was tested and she has the gene also. She has applied for clinical trials. However, since she is not symptomatic, she does not qualify. Um, University of Miami is on hold right now for an enrollment due to COVID. Do you have any suggestions for her um, to try and seek applying to a clinical trial? They live actually in South Carolina. Do you have any advice for that? First, I'm so sorry to hear about your late husband and how this disease has impacted your family. I'm sure it's been very difficult, especially given this past year. Um, in terms of clinical trials, you know, um, there are some observational uh, pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic uh, uh, trials, protocols. One is the um, FALS program at UMiami, as you mentioned. We at Columbia have a, a similar program called the ALS Families Project. Um, we're still enrolling in that and would be happy to speak with your daughter about the option to become part of that clinical trial. Um, and I believe there's one, maybe two others uh, around the states, and I'm not sure if, if they've also paused enrollment um, during COVID, but happy to talk more about those opportunities with her directly. You know, we've focused for this talk mostly on, you know, people with uh, ALS and an associated variant. Um, oh, the first goal is, uh, pro, you know, preventing disease progression and curing one's disease. The next thing we think about is how can we prevent disease, which is the goal for your daughter. And so participating in one of these trials, if someone's from a, a family with a familial or genetic form of ALS is, is essential in us learning more about uh, the earliest signs and symptoms of disease on a cellular level so we can create better preventative therapies in return. All right. That's yeah, COVID's kind of threw a wrench in everybody's plans, and I know clin clinical trials has definitely been affected with that. Um, why are some variants within the same gene pathogenic and some are not pathogenic and some are not? Yeah, so it really has to do with um, where the variant or, or where we are in the gene and what that typical part of the gene, uh, how that region of the gene typically functions. Okay. So um, you can have a variant and it might actually, you know, say you're changing a letter from an A to a T or a T to a G. Sometimes those are really significant changes that alter the protein structure and function dramatically. And sometimes those are really benign, simple changes in a region of the gene that's not all that important. And so it doesn't actually change perhaps the function of, of the gene. And we can kind of read straight through it without there being that big of a problem. So it's a good question. There are some that are much more highly pathogenic or you can think about as really harmful to the function of the gene. Whereas others, you know, for many different reasons, whether that's the, where it is, the location of it in the gene or the specific change, the small change, then it might not change dramatically the function of, of the gene. Okay, 
I don't see anything else in the chat or the Q&A. So thank you very much, Ellie, for being with us today. Of course, it was a pleasure to be here. And um, again, happy to take other questions over email and the uh, individual who reached out about uh, the pre-symptomatic clinical mm -hmm. trials. Happy to talk to them directly. All right. Thank you, Ellie.